In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, Jesus says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A few verses later, Jesus taught in Matthew 12, 36 and 37, Every word that men shall speak, every idle word, will give account thereof in the day of judgment. By your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Paul, as Chase just read for us a moment ago, speaks often about the way we use our speech. In fact, he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, Ephesians 4, 29, and make sure your speech is always seasoned with grace, Colossians 4, 6, so that you might know how you ought to answer every individual. And so the Bible says a lot about how we use our speech, and sometimes it's challenging. We read what the Bible says about speech, and our gut reaction may be just to say fewer words or really to say nothing at all, but the Bible won't let us off with that. The Bible says we are to control and restrain our speech, and yet we need to use it. Proverbs 13 and verse 3 says that out of our mouths we're going to be judged based on what we say, or he who keeps his mouth keeps his life, but he that opens wide his mouth will have destruction. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, Proverbs 10 and verse 19. So what we do with our speech, it matters. There are articles put out all the time about the kinds of things that successful people say regularly. I'm told successful people will say things about other op opportunities they have and things they haven't accomplished yet, and they'll always end with that phrase. I haven't saved up enough money yet. I haven't graduated from school yet. And to say those words is empowering. Or to encourage other people by saying, that is awesome. Or other positive affirmations like, can I help you with this thing or with that thing? Tonight, we're not going to talk about phrases that we should say that will empower us and make us better people. Tonight, I want to talk about seven words, statements, or phrases that every one of us should say this week that hopefully will be a blessing to somebody else's life. This is the kind of lesson. Maybe you write these seven phrases or statements in the cover of your Bible, and maybe these will be the kinds of words that you say, you know what, I want to say these kinds of things every week as I engage with other people and as I talk with them. Low estimates say you use about 6,000 words a week. Higher estimates say it's about 16,000 words a week, if six, a day, excuse me. So that means about 42,000 words a week on the low end and 112,000 on the high end. Either way, you're going to say a lot of words this week. Here are seven phrases, statements, or words that I hope every one of us says to somebody else this week that hopefully will bless their lives. Here's number one. Number one, I love you. Now, this phrase is often used in common vernacular kind of just as a mere statement about friendliness with other people. That's not the way I mean that we should use it this week, and that's not the way I mean to use it in the lesson tonight. This statement, this phrase, I love you, is sometimes casually thrown out. But in Scripture, it's a phrase that Christians need to learn to say and vocalize toward other people regularly because it's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and communicate that affection. Now, the New Testament says Christians are to love each other, and that's not new to you. You know the verses. Let brotherly love continue, Hebrews 13 and verse 1. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you. By this will all men know you're my disciples, if you love one another, John 13, 34 and 35. With fervent love, Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, see that you love one another with brotherly love, fervently from a pure heart. We're to love each other as we've been taught by God and abound in it, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, and 10. And all of those statements say that we're to show love toward one another. But this week, it's not enough just to show love. We need to be comfortable expressing it and saying it with our lips. Turn your Bible to the back of the New Testament and notice 2 John and also 3 John. Twice in these epistles, John begins both books by verbally or you could say by scribally confessing his love first for a congregation and then for an individual. So, for example, 2 John, verse 1, he says to the elect lady, speaking to the congregation, who I love in the truth, and not only I, but all of those who are faithful and following the way of Jesus Christ. John writes to this church and he says, you know what? I love you guys. You go over to 3 John, and it's not just some generic statement to a congregation on the whole. He's speaking to an individual. More than that, John is speaking to another man. And in 3 John 1, he says, To the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, I pray that everything goes well with you and that you may prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. John told Gaius, I love you. Paul was writing to Philemon about his slave Onesimus, and in Philemon verse 12, he uses a very strong phrase, really not found anywhere else in the New Testament, about Onesimus. He says, Philemon, I'm sending Onesimus back to you, and then he says, I'm sending you my very heart, because that's how much he loved him. The New Testament says we're to love one another, but we're also to express it. Now, we can't just say it. We've got to do more than that, but we can't do any less than that. 
We need to be the kind of people who say this to people this week, specifically Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, those that share the same faith that we do, we need to verbalize it and say the words, I love you. Christians changed and revolutionized the first century world with these kinds of statements. Jewish people loved other Jews. But search the Old Testament and you struggle to find this kind of communication flowing frequently back and forth between Old Testament Israel. People in the Greco-Roman world whose lives were put together due to their jobs or politics or entertainment were definitely not up for saying this kind of thing regularly, especially to somebody of the same gender. But Christians were different. And Christians expressed love and that's what we ought to do. Maybe at this time somebody's thinking, great for you, Hiram, that's good, but I'm a dude and I won't be telling other dudes that I love them. I'm just not wired like that. I'm not an emotional person. But before you start to think that, just think about the most masculine man who ever lived. Jesus was all man. He was fully God, but he was also fully man. He was a carpenter. He worked with his hands, Mark chapter 6 and verse 3. He walked hundreds of miles with his disciples in the Palestinian heat, Matthew 15 and verse 29. He hushed the sea in Mark chapter 4, verses 30 through 35. When they whipped him and scourged him so that his flesh was being ripped into pieces, John 19 and verse 1 says he took it like a man and he never begged for mercy. And that man, the God man, the perfect man, had no problem verbally expressing his love for his, uh, for his disciples and for other people. Now, we quoted John 13, 34 a moment ago, but listen to it from this vantage point. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you. See, he told him. John 15 and verse 12, he says the same thing. Who is John? He's the disciple who Jesus what? Love. But the question is, how did John know? With the rich young ruler, or rich young ruler in Mark's account, in Mark 10 and verse 21, it says, Jesus looked on him and loved him. It may be that we're too self-absorbed, but we're not too macho to vocalize these words. And I don't mean in a romantic way that borders on the line of unholiness. It just should be a natural thing. We should revolutionize our culture and our world as Christians as we learn to speak this way toward one another. Paul would say, let everything you do be done in love. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 14. Just do it this week. Especially to a brother or sister in Christ, just say the words. Let people know, I love you and I care about you. Madeline Lingle wrote this book, A Wrinkle in Time, and she had some strange views about faith, but on one occasion, this is what she said about her beliefs. This is a quote. She says, we try to be reasonable about what we believe, but what I believe is not reasonable at all. It's hilariously impossible. Now, I know what you and I believe is reasonable, and it's logical, and it's verified by inspired and historical truth, but appreciate the depth of what Madeline is saying in this quote. If Jesus is not the Son of God, it doesn't make sense to do what we're doing. Christians are at least temporarily, the strangest people in the world. You went down in water and were baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and in that moment, that blood became thicker than all other blood that exists, and because of that, now we love each other. Not only do we love each other, but we freely express it to other people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different genders and races and cultures, and none of that would make sense or be true if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. But since he was, we are strange people, at least for now. And we express our love to and for one another verbally, just like the New Testament says. This week, we just should do it. We should start saying this to each other more regularly because that's what agape love actually is. It's the well-being of another person. That's your chiefest and highest affection. This week, make this one of the phrases. Number two, this week, tell someone I'm praying for you. This week, make sure to tell somebody else that I'm praying for you. Now, Christians pray. We know that. And Christians also pray for other people. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul says, this is the first importance. I want men to pray everywhere. He says, I want you to pray for rulers, for all of those who are in authority and in various positions. I want you to do this and make intercession on their behalf because God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We know we need to pray, and we also need to pray for other people, but this statement takes it a step further. We not only need to pray for other people, we need to vocalize it and tell them. Now, either Paul had a ready recollection, unlike anybody in the history of the world, or Paul kept a prayer list active of people and congregations that he was offering up petitions for, because Paul prayed for a lot of people and a lot of churches. But here's the other thing Paul did. Paul would tell people, I'm praying for you. Open up your Bible to Romans chapter 1, and we're going to go quickly through these epistles, but I just want you to see how often Paul tells individuals and churches this very idea, this statement that I want us to say this week. By the way, all seven of these phrases, think about saying them to somebody that is in your presence, flesh and blood, not on social media, 
Not somebody halfway across the world. Somebody in your physical sphere of influence that you are going to encounter this week. And I know some of you have the not-so-spiritual gifts of sarcasm. Don't say all seven of your statements before you leave the building tonight, okay? If you do, then just keep saying them the rest of the week. Look at Romans chapter 1, 9, and 10. Paul says... God is his witness that without ceasing, he doesn't stop praying for the Christians at Rome, that by some means he might make his way and be with them and be present. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the church at Corinth had a lot of problems and a lot of issues. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul says, I constantly pray for the grace of God that's been administered to you. He does the same thing for the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 1. If you go to Ephesians 1, 15 and 16, Paul says, Since the day we heard of your faith and knew about it, we don't cease to pray for you regularly. He told the Philippian church in Philippians 1, 3 through 5, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy from the first day of your fellowship in the gospel until now. His favorite friend, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 3, he says, I'm mindful of your tears, and I am always praying for you. What I would say is his favorite church, the church at Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, I never stop praying for you. This week, tell somebody. Make sure you pray first, but then vocalize it and tell them. It's probably one of the most spiritual things we can do to say to somebody else, you were on my mind as I went to the throne of God, and I want you to know it. Jesus was always doing this. He says, Peter, I've prayed for you, Luke 22 and verse 31, and we should do the same thing. Now, if you've never done this before, I, I dare you tonight to go to YouTube and type in people that are deaf hearing for the first time, and try not to cry when you go to it. The cochlear implants have made this possible, that individuals who've never heard before finally get to hear their first sound. And individuals have been kind of collecting these YouTube videos where individuals, little children, grandparents and spouses, for the very first time after the implants go in, they finally get to hear their spouse's voice. Children, for the very first time in their lives, get to hear their parents. Siblings get to hear one another speak, and there are never any dry eyes. Because for the first time, people can hear like never before. Think about all the people in the world who've never heard the words. I'm praying for you. Think about all the people in your world who've never heard anybody say that to them before. I'm praying for you. What if we do it this week? We just say the words to people. Think about people you want to reach with the gospel. And there's just something about this statement that opens up their ears and they can hear it like they never could hear before. It's what happened to Paul on the island of Malta. In Acts 28, 7 through 13, Publius, his father, is sick. Paul does a miracle, but Paul also prays, and it opens up a door for the gospel. Don't ask them if they believe in God. Ask them what you can pray for them about. They might respond, I don't believe in God. You say, I know that, but I do, and I want to pray for you. There is something special about people seeing the God that they deny work in their lives, and all of a sudden they start to give them a chance. Would you do that for him? Just tell somebody, I'm praying for you. Individuals often are trying to reach up to God in prayer, and there's just something about feeling like you can't connect. Psalm 61 talks about crying out to God and not being heard. But this idea of praying for somebody else and letting them know it makes all the difference in the world. And it'll make all the difference in your world if you would do it for somebody else. We often talk about John 17 and Jesus' prayer for unity, but listen to what John 17 says. Neither do I pray for these alone, but for them also which will believe on me through your word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe that you've sent me. And we say that's Jesus' prayer for unity, and it is. But just as it's preserved in your New Testament, it's also Jesus letting you know you weren't there, neither was I. Hey, I've been praying for you. Even in heaven, he hasn't stopped praying. Hebrews 7.25, he ever lives to make intercession. We're like Jesus when we pray for other people, but we're also like Jesus when we tell them that we're doing it. This week, tell somebody else. Ask them if you can pray for them about something, and then actually do it, because it'll make a difference. Now, here's number three. This week, say this phrase to somebody else. Ask someone else to pray for you. Say this phrase, pray for me. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, the most famous verse in this section in 1 Thessalonians 5 is actually verse 17. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul says, pray without ceasing. But in 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, Paul says, brothers, pray for us. That would be for Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Paul wanted prayers for him and his co-workers. But here's the question in verse 25. What does Paul want prayers about? He doesn't say. It's rather generic, and Paul is simply saying, I need you to be praying for me. 
And there's nobody in the New Testament who requested prayers more than the Apostle Paul. In Ephesians 6, 18 through 20, Paul said, Pray for me that I might preach the word and that I might do it with all boldness. In Colossians 4, 3 through 4, Paul not only prayed for open doors to preach the gospel, but he also prayed for his delivery. When I get the chance to preach, I pray that I can say it like it really needs to be said. Paul prayed that the gospel would have free course in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 1, or that he could be delivered from wicked and unreasonable people that really weren't interested in Christianity, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 2. This week, what if we say the words to somebody else? Would you pray for me? James 5.16 says that we need to confess our faults to each other and pray for one another that we may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. What that means is collectively the prayers of the righteous have an effect, and you need that effect in your life. If you're saying to yourself right now, there is nobody, I don't know one Christian in the flesh, that I would feel comfortable confessing anything to, not necessarily sin, your worries, your fears, upcoming appointments, stressors in your life. If there's not one person in the flesh that you feel comfortable enough with to go to and utter these words, there's two things going on. Number one, the devil is smiling. If you say, well, it's just me and the Lord and just my prayer closet, the devil's smiling. And then number two, you may not be as spiritual as you think you are. Because the reality is we need to be praying for ourselves, but we also need other people interceding for us. Ask Abimelech. Genesis 20, Abraham lies about Sarah being his sister, and God closes up all the wounds of the Philistines. And then he says in Genesis 20 and verse 7, you go have that man of God pray for you, Abraham, because he's a prophet, and I will hear him. And he did, and God responded. When Eliphaz, Eliphaz Bildad, and Zophar finally meet God in, Genesis, in Job chapter 42, God shows up and he says, you haven't spoken right by me like Job has. I want you to have my servant Job pray for you, and then I will hear. Job 42 and verse 9 says, Job prayed, and God heard. You need other people praying for you, and I need the same thing. Ask somebody this week. You know, I'm afraid that sometimes when it comes to public prayer and requesting it, we've kind of made it like the principal's office. Now, when I was in school, there was only two reasons why you would go to the principal's office. If your name came across the intercom, there were two reasons you'd be being called to the principal's office. Number one, you were going home early. My mom never picked me up early, okay? <laughs> Number two, you did something very, very bad. And when people heard it, there was a collective ooh that went across the classroom because you're being called to the principal's office. And we can make requests in prayer, the spiritual boogeyman, where we might think to ourselves, this person is requesting prayer, either publicly or privately with me, because their life is caving in. But it just might be the case that they're requesting prayer so that their life doesn't cave in. Cast your burden on the Lord and he'll sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be moved. Psalm 55 and verse 22. We need to get in the habit of asking other people to pray for us. Why? Because it says Christianity is a team sport and we don't do it alone. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17 and verse 17. There are prayer warriors besides ourselves that do have God's ears. Paul told the Colossians, Epaphras is laboring for you night and day in prayer that you might stand fully mature in all the will of God. Colossians 4 and verse 12. You need other people praying for you because there are times when you feel like God's just not hearing you. And to be requesting prayers from other people means the world. Because what we're saying in that moment is this. In my most important conversation today, your name came up. And it was for your eternal good. It's what Samuel says to rebellious Israel in 1 Samuel 12, 23. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. And list somebody this week. You don't have to tell them all your deep and dark secrets, but also don't give a generic sanitized request. Level with somebody about a worry, about a fear, about a concern. Don't make one up, but you know you have them. And just go to somebody and just say it. I'm struggling with this, or I'm concerned about this, or I'm fearful about this, or this is getting the best of me. And what I need from you, I need you to pray for me. It'll humble you. It'll change you. And it'll show you God's working, not just through what you're doing spiritually, but through what other people are doing. Here's the fourth one. This week, ask somebody, can we study? The first time you do this, it's awkward. But the more you utter this phrase, naturally, the more evangelistic you'll become. Acts 17 and verse 11, the Bereans searched the scriptures daily, but that's because Paul and company went to Thessalonica and engaged them in the synagogue in a Bible study. Turn your Bible to Acts chapter 8 and notice what's going on with the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter 8, Philip is in Samaria. Neil taught about Philip, I believe, in the NPR Bible class on Wednesday night. But in Acts chapter 8, Philip is in Samaria preaching about Jesus and the kingdom of God, Acts 8, 12, and 13. The Spirit takes him down to a street called Strait, which is in Gaza, the desert, 
and he finds a man there sitting in his chariot reading the prophet Isaiah. He comes alongside him. I'm in Acts 8, 30 and 31. And Philip says to him, do you understand what you're reading? And he humbly says, how can I unless some man should guide me? He invites Philip up into the chariot. They start studying. He's reading Isaiah. Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. And in verse 34, the eunuch finally says to Philip, the nobleman says, what's this prophecy about? Is Isaiah speaking about himself or some other man? And Acts 8 and verse 35 says, Philip began at that very same scripture and started preaching to him about Jesus. Listen, I know the question isn't in the text, but it's definitely implied. Philip came alongside a man studying his Bible who was already religious and essentially said, can we have a Bible study? If you want to be successful in evangelism, based on Acts 8, you need at least three things. Number one, you need an open mouth. You've got to say something. You've got to ask the question. You have to approach people. It becomes less awkward the more you do it. Just say to somebody, this week, can we study? You also need an open Bible. They didn't just sit down and talk about, well, what do you think about it? And what do I think? Or in my church, we believe this, or I believe that. Philip says, let's read Isaiah together and let's study and see what the passage says. And he began at that scripture and preached to him Jesus. But the third thing you need is somebody with an open mind. The eunuch had already come back from worship, but he didn't believe he had it all figured out. And because of that, he was a ready candidate to receive the gospel. Now, what this doesn't mean is that you have to do the study. Doesn't mean that at all. You may say, I'm ill-equipped to do the Bible study. Just ask somebody. And if you're ill-equipped, perhaps you get them to the table with somebody else and you're the silent partner. You don't have to do a Bible study from stem to stern all the way to the baptistry to be evangelistic. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered. God calls the growth. God makes Christians. We just invite people to meet God. You don't have to do the Bible study. You don't have to get a yes the first time. Galatians 6 and verse 9 says, don't grow weary in doing well. All you have to do is just keep asking. You don't have to know all the answers to all the Bible questions they're going to ask you. 1 Peter 3.15 says, sanctify the Lord in your heart. Be ready to give an answer of everyone that asks you for the reason of the hope that's in you and do it with gentleness and respect. You don't have to know it all. All you have to do is introduce them to the one that does. The one that knows the answers to all of their questions and the questions they're not even asking that they really need to be. This week, ask somebody to study. Ask your friend. Ask your neighbor. The waitress at the restaurant that you frequent. Your non-Christian family members and friends. Just ask the word. Say, can we study the Bible? Hey, what do you think the Bible teaches on this subject? Would you mind sitting down with me so that we can study together? I know where I am tonight. I know y'all know him. I know you do. When he was 65 years old, he was living off $99 a month in Social Security. He was in what he called a junk car and very small living quarters. He said, I want to change my life. He started talking to his friends. What are you good at? They said, we really like your chicken recipe. And so I don't know who kept count of this, but they say he went to every place, every restaurant in his vicinity with his chicken recipe and said, hey, I want to give you this for free. All I want is a portion of the sales. It said that he was told no 1,009 times. And finally, he got one yes, one yes. And it changed the way Americans eat chicken. All you need is one yes. Don't worry about all the no's. Just ask somebody this week, would you study the Bible with me? Would you be willing to sit down? Listen, I don't know how many people are here tonight. If 20 people ask, if 20 people take this seriously and ask, and only 10 of us here, yes, we'll be engaged in 10 more Bible studies than we were before we walked in tonight. Just 20 people. If 20 people say, I'm going to ask somebody, and five people say yes, there'll be five more people closer to leading somebody to heaven, and we'll be glad we did in the end. Would you do it this week? Just say the words to somebody. Would you study the Bible with me? If they say no to you, they're not any more lost than they were before you asked them. But we've got to have the courage to do it. Now, here's the next one. Come and see. This is not like the question before it or the statement before it. This is a different one altogether. This is an idea about inviting somebody. I'm thinking in this point about inviting somebody to the worship services here at the Lehman Avenue Church of Christ. I've been in evangelism seminars where this has kind of been put down. People say, this is kind of a soft startup. We need something stronger than just inviting somebody to the building. We need to do what we talked about in the last point, ask people to study the Bible. But just getting people to come to worship services really isn't enough. In John 1 and verse 46, Philip finds Nathaniel, and he says, we found the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And what does Philip tell him? He says, come and see. The woman from Samaria in John chapter 4 and verse 29, after Jesus engages in discussion with her, she goes throughout Samaria saying, come and see a man who's told me everything I've ever done. Couldn't this be the Christ? 
In neither one of those texts are they inviting anybody to a worship service. They were inviting people to see the flesh and blood Jesus Christ. But here's the question. Since the flesh and blood Jesus Christ isn't here, can you do any better to engage people with Jesus Christ than to invite them to the people that are the flesh and blood representatives of Jesus Christ? Ephesians 5 and verse 30, Paul says, we are members of his flesh, his body, and his bones. You can't do any better than that. Ask somebody this week, would you come to worship? If they already go to another church, ask them about Sunday night or Wednesday night. Ask them to come and see. Find out what's being studied, drum up some interest, and extend the invitation. Now, here's one stipulation on this. When you invite them, make sure that you show up, okay? Nothing ruins an invitation like inviting somebody on Sunday night and then not being there or on a Wednesday night. Don't say and fail to practice, but just invite somebody to come and see. I know scores of people, but I don't have to talk about scores of people. I know about myself and Brittany. I wouldn't be a Christian if somebody didn't do this. It wasn't an elaborate Bible study. I wasn't really walking in a church building seeking the truth. It was really this one question, this idea would you come to church? 2009, just one time, would you come to church? I said, sure, what do I got to lose? Study in the Bible, and you just really never know. Just come and see. Would you just study? Come and see what it's all about. It's what God invites everybody to do. Taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalm 34 and verse 8. This week, just ask somebody, whether they're religious or not, whether they already attend worship or not, just say to somebody this week, I want to invite you to worship service. We'd love to have you here. Here's the next one. This is hard for some. But this week, say these words. Say, I'm sorry. Now, when we sin against God, we ought to apologize to him, Psalm 51, 3 and 4. But when we sin against other people, we need to apologize to them. Now, I know some of us have never been wrong before, except the time we thought we were wrong, and even then we could have been right, and so we never really say these words. But the Bible teaches over and over again it's a healthy practice for us to confess that we make mistakes, that we fall short. Psalm 38 and verse 18, that should be, it says, I confess my transgression and I am sorry for my sin. James 5, 16 communicates the same idea. This week, don't make anybody drag it out of you. If you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, if you get irritated, if you promise and fail to deliver, when your anger gets the best of you, if you find yourself short with other people, say these words this week to somebody. Don't ever make people think they have to accept the worst version of you. Be better than that. Don't think to yourself, you know what, I'm just in a bad mood, and that's just how it is. Be better than that. And when you fail, and we will, every one of us does, you ought to beat people coming to you by saying these words. I'm sorry I did that. Confess to God, 1 John 1 and verse 9, but also confess to the people that you wrong, because nobody has to accept us at our worst. We ought to be people that are trying to be reformed and be changed. The University of Chicago School of Business did a massive study that I read this week about why we struggle to say we're sorry, and they gave two reasons. They said, number one, sometimes when we feel like there's shared blame, we really don't want to confess until the other person comes out and confesses. We want to make sure that we're not going out on a limb, and if they've done wrong, we want to hear them confess too. But even if we haven't, even if they haven't done wrong, we struggle to confess that we're sorry. The second reason is they say, we don't know how we're going to be received. We don't know how they're going to respond to our apology, and that brings up two ideas. The first one is, be somebody that's easy to apologize to. Don't be somebody that has everything that happened on instant replay. Don't make people feel bad about the fact that they've erred. When they're trying to apologize, don't say, yeah, but you forgot this part. And let's not forget to mention this part. Let them apologize. Be somebody easy to apologize to. But here's number two. Learn how to apologize well. Benjamin Franklin said, don't ever ruin an apology with an excuse. Listen, you don't apologize because you are concerned with how somebody else is going to receive it. You apologize because you did wrong. God said, Adam, have you eaten of the fruit that I told you not to of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He said, it was the woman you gave me. She took and gave to me and I ate. He questioned Eve and she said, the serpent deceived me. I conceived and I ate. They couldn't admit it. They couldn't just say the words, God, we messed up. We're sorry. We did wrong. God's favorite people are people who can say these words. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. But we also need to be in the habit of confessing to one another this week. There may be a time, there may be several times where we need to utter these words and we shouldn't hesitate to do it. Here is the seventh and final one tonight. This one is to God. This week, make sure to say amen. In the Old Testament in Hebrew, in the New Testament in Greek, amen means the same thing. In both Testaments, it means yes. It means truly. It means so be it. It means I affirm. It means let it be. This week, make sure to say it. Of all the things you say this week, when you bow your head in prayer, make sure to say, Amen. Amen is not the biblical way to tell God, peace out, or I'm done talking, or signing off now until next time. 
Amen is a way of saying, God, I've said a lot of stuff, but so be it. Whatever you decide is what we'll do. Matthew 26 and verse 39, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, I want you to take this cup from me. If it be possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And when you say amen, if you really mean it, if you're not deceiving, then you're saying the very same thing. But if you won't let it be, if you pray to God about things, if we pray to God about things and we won't let it be because it isn't the way we want it to be, then we really don't mean our amen. The biblical amen is to say, I petitioned you, God, about all of these things, and I trust you. You're better than me. You're smarter than me, and you don't have to explain yourself to me. And so you know what? I lay these things at your feet, and in Jesus' name, whatever you decide to do, it'll be fine with me. Tim Keller, in his book on intimacy and prayer, says this, In short, God will either give us what we ask for, or he will give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything he knew. In the end, when you request things from God, God will either say, here's your request, is granted, 1 John 5, 14 through 15, or he will give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything he knew. Listen to Moses, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. God's perfect and all of his ways are just. Can you say that? Psalm 18 and verse 30, as for our God, his way is perfect. He's done all things well. Mark 12 and verse 37, when we say amen, that's what we're saying. If we're not deceiving ourselves, when we bow our heads in prayer, we're saying to God, you know what? I trust you. And in the end, you always get your way. And if I'm your person, that means it's always going my way, if not now, in the resurrection. And so Paul can say, we know all things work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose and those that love him. And it's based on that we can say God, we offer up prayers this week, but in every one of them, we say, so be it. We release it. We let it go. Truly, it's yours, and we give it over to you. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20, the verse that was on the screen a moment ago, Paul says, it's through Christ that all the promises of God find their yes, and they, their amen in him, and it's through him that we utter our amen to God. This week, don't forget to say amen to God and then mean it. I'm sure we've got all kinds of things in our minds about our own lives and our own hearts, and we're going to pray to God this week, but when we pray, let's remember that God always does all things well, and let's remember to trust Him. You've got several thousand words to speak this week, somewhere in the range of 42,000 to 112,000, but make sure you work these seven in. What if you wrote these seven things down and put them on your fridge and tried to work these in every single week? How could you change your corner of the world, where you live, the people that you impact, if you said to people, Christians, I love you, and I really mean it. Not ashamed to say it. I don't care that it's strange in our world. I'm temporarily a strange person because I'm Jesus' disciple. Hey, I'm praying for you. You don't have to believe in prayer, but I'm praying for you, and I want you to know it. Would you pray for me? I'm sorry for the things that I've done. Would you study the Bible with me? Would you come to worship? Come and see. What if you tried to say these seven phrases every single week? What if you said the most important words tonight if you've never voiced them before an audience like this one? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Those seven words, based on faith and based on biblical repentance, if you're immersed in water after you say those words, it will change your eternity if you continue to walk in the light. And if you need to do that tonight, we're going to stand and sing a song to encourage us. We'd be happy to assist you in that. Acts 2.38 says you'll receive the Holy Spirit. All your sins will be forgiven. If you've already said those words and you need help this week in any way, we'd be happy to pray with you and pray for you. If you need to respond to the invitation tonight, come now as together we stand and as we sing.